Good morning, I am Jessie Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to our panelists who are joining us today. <coughs> we are so thrilled about this lineup. Uh, we have, a few of us have used the term geeked. So I hope that um, all of you advocates are going to be as geeked uh, as we are. Um, just a heads up that we are recording today's forum to share later as a video, and we're also going to release it as a podcast that you can get um, on your whatever listening app you choose or on our website, and we'll send out all that information after the forum with links to the recordings. So we ask that you stay muted, but we are taking questions and comments via the chat feature. And panelists, you're welcome to look at the chat if you want to, and if not, that's also fine. Um, we will try to get to some of those uh, during the discussion uh, if we can. And thank you to all of you who submitted questions in advance as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Terry Brooks to get us going. Hey, Jesse, thanks a lot. Uh, as always, we begin these Wednesday gatherings by saying welcome. Uh, we love the fact that many of you uh, have achieved almost a perfect attendance pin since we uh, started in March, and uh, we're so glad uh, to have you as persistent partners. We're also really, really excited whenever we get a, a newbie on these calls, so our job is to hook you for every Wednesday. Uh, in, in terms of thinking about uh, today's issue, uh, I certainly am not suggesting that this is the way you need to look at it, but I, I think we at KYA are trying to, to look at the long neglected and prioritized issue of racial injustice with two very different lens. Uh, one is a lens of vulnerability. So I certainly feel that because I certainly uh, publicly and, and uh, fully acknowledge that there are many, many aspects of that issue that uh, I don't know enough about, that I need to learn more about. Uh, some of those are very discreet, some of those are much broader. So uh, I hope you hear that we as an organization, and I personally uh, am trying to approach that uh, with a, a vulnerability to say that, that, that we need to learn and know and feel and understand more. By the same token, I have to tell you that there are other issues that I think we could approach with some certitude. And when I think about an issue, uh, an angle on the issue of certitude, uh, it sort of revolves around a bias for action. Uh, I am totally convinced uh, absolutely convinced that we can see significant policy wins in 2021 in Frankfurt if, if we do our due diligence. Uh, and I am not suggesting this is the way it should be. I am suggesting the way it is, is that the way to move policy around disproportionality and inequities in Frankfurt is through hard, quantitative, and revealing data. We have to build a, a cogent case as to why that is an urgent priority. So there are so many things that I, I feel very inadequate on and very vulnerable about uh, around this issue, but that's not one. I, I really think that as we set up our work for kids and families in Frankfurt, and frankly in Washington as well, and maybe even City Hall in Louisville or your county seat, wherever you're watching from, uh, we, we've got to be able to give lawmakers and elected leaders hard data. And that's really the focus of today. We, we want to talk about the inequities and the injustices that permeate uh, what it means to grow up uh, in Kentucky uh, as a kid of color. Uh, that's the, the laser focus we want to put on it today. Uh, I do want to say that as many forums that we present it, we always end with, and I'm just going to begin with the ending. Uh, this is just the first step. Uh, you have got to be involved with us, with all of us, 
in terms of action uh, around this issue. So that's the frame, or at least that's the frame that Courtney Downs told me to say. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, moderating the, the rest of the session is Courtney. And so, Courtney, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, before they get introduced, I just want to give a shout out and a thanks to our panelists. Uh, we know you guys are busy and we richly appreciate your expertise and presence today. So, Ms. Downs, take it from here. All right, thank you, Terry, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am really excited about this morning's forum uh, that we're calling the Landscape for Policy Practice and Systems Changes to Advance Racial Equity. Um, so as we all know, equity work is really hard. It's, it's multifaceted and ongoing, and as Terry said, just having one policy um, solution isn't necessarily gonna help us achieve that goal. So what we want today to be is kind of like a beginning dialogue of sorts. So we want this to be an opportunity for everyone to be able to start pulling out the themes and the stories um, and the data as we work on identifying some specific policy asks. So again, today is kind of like laying the groundwork, um, giving advocates the opportunity to hear from one another about the bigger picture issues, and then also to hear about work that's already being done um, and how we can be helpful in continuing to move that work forward. So uh, last week, for those who were um, able to join us, you know that we started with some Kids Count data, and then we heard stories from three incredible young people from across the state. Um, and today is going to look pretty similar, where we're going to uh, have a brief data presentation to start, and then we are going to hear from our excellent panel um, of partners, who I will introduce you to right now. So we have uh, Karina Barrias. She is the Executive Director at La Casita Center. We have Dr. Kish Kumi Price, who is the Director of Education Policy and Programming at the Louisville Urban League. Katura Heron, uh, who is a policy strategist with the ACLU. And Vivian Lasley Bibbs, who is the Acting Director of the Cabinet for Health and Family Services Office of Health Equity. And Vivian is going to get us started with a quick data presentation. So, Vivian, the floor is all yours. I'm going to share, uh, share my screen you. here. Can you share my slides for me? There you Thank go. You. Everybody seeing that? We seeing that? Yep. Okay. So everybody good? Okay, great. So, you know, you had the, you know, you talked about the data a lot already, and I'm not going to go and take a deep dive into data, even though that's my world. We wanted to kind of just lay the foundation for the other folks that are going to come after me about what data is available, what we know and what we don't know, and what we need to know in order to um, address some of these inequities and, 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 and hopefully have a true systems change and policies that need to move forward in order to close the disparity gap and to, to um, really address inequities for our youth in the state of Kentucky. Next slide, please. Great. So there's some underlying factors, of course, for our dis disparities in our youth. And these aren't going to be, you know, anything new to all of us that are here today. I mean, we all work in different areas of addressing our, uh, some of the, the things that we're seeing in our youth across the state. We know that trauma, especially as it relates to violence and instability in the home and, and also having uh, parents who are incarcerated. We all know that the ACEs data shows that Kentucky is one of the number one states of having at least one parent incarcerated. Uh, so that plays a heavy impact on our youth. Also stressors. And what are those stressors as it relates to their neighborhood, their physical and built environment? Um, do they feel safe and what social support do they have? And of course, the, the SES, um, poverty is the driver for a lot of our inequities across the state and family structure. Um, single family households and the biases that can bring as providers also uh, uh, have stereotypes come into play and that can also um, lead to stigma and depression in our youth. And then of course we have biases, racism and other isms that are ever present that are impacting our youth every day. Uh, next slide please. So what data do we currently capture? And this isn't an exhaustive list, just to just give you an idea of what data is available. Some is in public domain and some is not. So many of you may know about the YBRFS, which is the Youth Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. And we've been doing that in Kentucky since 1997. And it's done with uh, middle school and high school youth. And it covers six focus areas. Um, those include 
uh, violence, alcohol and drug abuse, physical activity, nutrition and sexual health, and tobacco use. Um, so we get a lot of our information um, about what's going on with our youth by that. Uh, it is broken down by race and, and ethnicity uh, and, and other demographics. Um, it is a voluntary survey and it's done randomly. Uh, there's a random sample selected of middle school and high schools across the state. Kids count, of which you're very familiar with. Juvenile justice looks at racial and ethnic differences in incarceration rates and uh, in our youth. That is not in public domain. Uh, you have to ask for that data. It has been, it has been collected, but you have to ask. Uh, of course, Department of Education has information on uh, the academic performance of our kids in the state. You can get housing information. You can get information on the built and physical environment. We have an environmental public health tracking network system at the Department for Public Health that's looking at the impact of youth on their built and physical environment. And then we have uh, a partnership with the Department for Behavioral um, and Community-Based Services looking and the Human Development Institute at UK looking at intellectual and physical disability data of our youth. Next slide. So even though we capture it, are we able to find it? And is it able to drive some of the decisions we make? So I just pulled some information that you've probably seen in Kids Count. In Kentucky, children who are Black or Hispanic more likely to live in poverty uh, than children who are non-Hispanic white. Um, they're likely contributing factors for a cluster of, of high rates of low birth weights in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and in Kentucky, fourth graders eligible for free or reduced lunch are half as likely as their higher income peers to attain reading proficiency, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And there's also alarming data that by the time uh, children reach the fourth grade, especially for African American males, if they cannot read, that's how the Department of Justice decides whether they're going to build another um, institution <laughs> to house uh, inmates. So that's, that's, to me, an alarming statistic that they use to determine where they're going to put another institution based on the academic performance of our young black males. Next slide, please. So what have we learned? I mean, all of us are working in these areas today. Here's what I think we know from the practices that we're in. Um, and these are the things that we're working to improve. We, we know that communities of color and other marginalized communities are disproportionately impacted. We've been talking about disparities a long time. We've been talking about social determinants of health a long time. We've been talking about those midstream factors that are impacting the health of our youth. We know that some guide, that guidelines are needed to ensure the equitable distribution of resources. You know, I, I often talk to people and we get what's equal and what's equitable confused. They're very different. Something that's equal is not necessarily, necessarily equitable. And I think we need to kind of uh, understand what that means for, for specific communities, because it's all about the unmet needs of that particular community, and there's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, I think trust and transparency are key. Um, I can't say that enough when you're really wanting to get to the root causes of what's happening in communities with our youth. Um, I think we need to start addressing some of those upstream factors. And if you're, health, if you're familiar at all with the health equity framework model, that's kind of taking the medical model that we've been living in and the world that we've been living in and translating that to the socio-ecological model, which is really looking at the community, the individual, their interpersonal relationships and the organizational structure within which they reside. And then we look at social determinants of health as those midstream things. We all talk about housing transportation, education, air quality, good schools. And then, but what is driving that? That's policy, structural and institutional barriers like racism, classism, ableism, all of those isms. So I think we need to really start talking about those root causes if we really wanna make substantive change. So that drives me to the last bullet, is how do we get true policy and system change? So hopefully the great minds on the, on the panel today can give us some good food for thought, some good ideas on what that might look like. How moving forward, how might we as an entity, as a body, as a collective, put recommendations forward to have some of that play out in Frankfurt with our legislators. Next slide, please. 
So how do we address these inequities? Well, one thing that I think COVID-19 has revealed for a lot of us, because it's kind of pulled the Band-Aid off what's truly happening uh, in our, uh, not in just in the youth in Kentucky, not just here in Kentucky, but our youth everywhere. Um, we made a lot of assumptions when we had to do non-traditional instruction. We just assumed that every child had access to the internet, broadband internet access, computer capabilities, skill set that would facilitate learning with NTI. So we got to address the digital divide that, that exists in many of our vulnerable and marginalized communities. And we have to recognize messaging and communication strategies that take into account some social and cultural norms. We sent out a lot of messaging during COVID-19. I mean, they were coming out uh, almost daily, but were they really resonating and speaking to the communities they needed to speak to? And we didn't take into, some, into account some of those social and cultural norms of how people receive and process messages within their own community. Um, we need to, to really do better with community engagement. How many people that, that do we have that have truly had the lived experiences that sit on our boards, our advisory councils, sit on our committees? How many times have we really, are we really hearing that voice? Um, and I really like the collective impact model, which really brings people from across different sectors, from across different agencies, and they sit around the table and think of how what they do can be presented in a unified way to tackle one or two specific issues. And then the true policy and system changes need to address the historical and social injustices that we've talked about previously, and that I think within the, the, the um, climate of the country, is asking us to recognize. So how has racism and discrimination and some of these others played out into what we're seeing in, in our youth current day? Next slide. That it? All right, so I'm done. So my job now hopefully has been done and laid the groundwork, great groundwork for all these other great minds that you're gonna hear from today that can kind of build upon what I have said and then hopefully questions that you may have at the end, I'll be able to answer. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Courtney and we can move on. But thank you for the opportunity this morning. Thank you, Vivian. And please feel free to jump in even in this conversation and discussion that we're having because we'd love to hear more from you as well. Um, but I, we want this, as I said, to be more of a conversation. So obviously, Katora, Kish, Vivian, and Karina, um, you know, feel free to to respond to one another and, and to build off of each other's comments. But um, Vivian, I think the groundwork that you laid is absolutely perfect, because one of the things that I was thinking um, when I was preparing for this is that, you know, I think it, it, it can be easy sometimes for people to almost like separate um, the lived experiences or kind of separate themselves from the lived experiences of the people who actually make up the data. And so that's what I really wanted to dive into to start with, because there's, there's a lot that happens between, you know, in the community day to day and what's reflected in the data or when it's reflected in the data. So for each of you kind of from your respective sectors, so thinking about like juvenile justice, education, child welfare, health, the Latinx community, um, what are some of the stories behind the data or, and what are some things that we think that advocates need to know? Does anyone want to jump in, Katora, Kish? Hey, I'll, I'll start. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, thank everyone who um, is on, on this. One of the things that really stood out to me when Vivian was presenting was when, when she got to the slide that was talking about data and she went when she hit on juvenile justice, she said that you have to ask for this data. And so I think that that is a very, very, um, that's super important because when you talk about young people who are impacted by the juvenile justice system, even folks who are um, working in the sector don't really know what's happening within the juvenile justice system. And so when we're talking about how that impacts communities or um, how uh, community partners can get involved or really like knowing and understanding the landscape if you're not within DJJ or if you're not within the court system, like you really have no idea what is happening. And so that is one thing that I want to point out um, that I think that is super, super important. But then I also think that when, when we look at 
um, community and we look at what's happening right now across the nation and you look at over police and you look at poverty and you look at all of these things, the same things that we're seeing in our adult system, the over incarceration of black and brown people um, that has made up mass incarceration, that's the same thing in our juvenile justice system. Um, the same way that um, the communities are being over policed and um, black and brown adults are having negative um, black and brown adults are having negative are having negative interactions with police are having negative interactions. are still having those same interactions and then also it's the same thing when you're talking about and I'm sure that um, 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 someone else will speak on this but also when you're talking about the school system and how um, most of complaints or, or kids are funneled into the ju the juvenile justice system from from education. And so I, I think that it's important for me, it's just important, like, I just want to make that known before we dig deeper. And so um, I think that that point there um, kind of connects everything else, if that makes sense. And so, um, but I also want to say too, is that whenever you look at um, youth history, whether they're in juvenile justice or they're in foster care or social services, they're the same type of kids. Um, if you look at them on paper and you look at um, the traumas that they've dealt with, you look at family structure, you look at poverty, they're the same young people. And so um, I, I think that my heart bleeds and has always been for, for youth impacted by the juvenile justice system because it's almost like those are the youth that we don't talk about enough but they're our same youth that are um, are in in our social services. So I'll I'll leave it at there and then jump in later. And and I would like to share. Um, you know, for, first, thank you, Miss Vivian, for for the information that you shared this morning. And so good to to be with Katara and following her uh, with with my comment. Um, Ms. Vivian, you mentioned something about collective impact model and, and you know, from being from a community that, that is invisible in, in all the ways of uh, and shape and forms, you know, all the policy and system changes are uh, reported once our children and our families are in the system, but before that, our children and our families are invisible. They don't exist. Our issues, our barriers, our struggles are, are unknown because they are not mainstream. So, so the, the system changes that, that need to happen need to be included in, in, in everything that, that we do. You know, just when we talk about trauma, you know, usually it's a trauma thinking that, that these children are born in, in this country, thinking that, that maybe, uh, you know, they have uh, other kind of struggles. But can you imagine children being so scared every day uh, for their, they don't know if they, if they are going to see their parents again. They don't know if they are going to disappear because they are going to be taken by ICE. You know, by, just by the fear, when COVID started, so many families called us and said, can we go to the hospital? Can we get tested? Because they were scared that it was, it was you know, a trap to, 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 to be deported. So you can imagine the impact of these children. These children and these youth that have been given by the system so much power whenever, you know, uh, advocates or service providers do not provide meaningful access to language and put children and teenagers in situations of re-traumatizing them by uh, making them the ones that have to carry all the knowledge from their families. We had once um, a situation where a mom that, that was diagnosed with cancer the, the service provider as the 15 year old child to interpret for mom. Can you imagine what it meant for that child to tell her mom, hey mom, you have cancer and you're gonna die. So, you know, all those different, all, all of different, all those different uh, kind of changes that, 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 that need to be included. You know, when we ask, do you feel safe? What does safety means to you? What does safety means to me? You know, I don't know if, if any of you that, that, uh, 
have not been put in a category of being a minority. You know, it's scared that their young, their teenage uh, son is going to be outside. I'm scared for my son. You know, I'm scared. I always tell him, carry with you your birth certificate. I got him the passport card. So, you know, they know he is a U.S. citizen because, you know, safety for me means what if I don't see my child and my child is taken to immigration jail? What if the police grabs him and, and thinks that he is, you know, doing something bad and they and they kill him? That safety, you know, for all of us means so many different things. I'm also thinking about um, you know, how in the area of education, we measure education with a white lens. So, you know, we have all these kiddos that come from countries that they, they may be not, um, uh, maybe they don't know how to read and write in any language, but they have so much knowledge and, and, and they are maybe learning their third language and maybe, you know, they, they have been working in the fields uh, uh, with, with their parents since, since they are five years old. So that knowledge that they have is considered not important. And, and, you, and I don't know you, but you know that if I would be a, a teenager and somebody tells me, you know what, you know, you, you know how to plant a seed, you know how to take care of crops, you've been working like, a, like an adult since you are five, and that is not good knowledge, you know, that, that in, in reality causes so much, so much pain. And, and at the same time, you know, they give so many limitations to, to these children. Now, when we talk about community engagement, what does community engagement mean to you? What does community engagement mean to, to communities that are invisibles? The ways that we are connecting uh, uh, communities by website, by flyers, you know, I, every time that I have the opportunity to say this, you know, that doesn't work for all communities. The way that, that we think, you know, oh, we're going to reach out. People are not coming to our events. Why is it that they are not responding? It's because the way that we are inviting people and the way that we conceive community engagement, it's not how communities that are invisible and with so many limitations uh, do not understand because they are not part of it, because they have not been asked, because they have not been included, because they have not been part of the collective. So I think that as advocates, it's very important for us not to think that we know all the answers. I don't know all the answers. I am, I am Latinx, but you know, I, I am only one person. I don't know the answers of all my people. So it is my duty for me to ask. It is my, my duty for me to invite families to give their opinion and to change the framework instead of telling them, this is what you need, this is what we're going to do. Ask, what do you need? What would be meaningful to you? What would work for you for the best interest of your family and your children and your youth? Great. Thank you, Karina. Kish, do you want to jump in and add anything from education? Absolutely. So thank you for opening up this um, conversation because I feel like we have all of these um, kind of subgroups talking about uh, these issues and the collective energy of how all these systemic inequities are connected, I think is really important. So I appreciate the discussion. Um, one of the things that really hit when I heard Vivian uh, present around community engagement and to Karina's point is the notion that presenting an idea to a community is community engagement. <laughs> like the fact that you've already come up with what you think is the solution and then saying, well, what do you think about this? When the community is, is well versed and able to solve its own problems, right, and issues with support. So I guess my um, biggest concern in all of this is that when we talk community involvement or engagement, it's, it's a last box that's checked, not the first. And so um, that, that becomes an issue when you talk about any kind of policy change um, or, or implementation, even for that matter. Um, I think those, those issues that we talk about, um, for instance, 
the connection with juvenile justice and over policing and um, looking at how that starts in the school with school push out. And, um, you know, we look at even our school resource officers. I know here in Louisville at the beginning of the year, it was a, a big deal that um, the district decided not to renew the contract with LMPD officers. Well, right now, I guess so many could applaud the, the direction that they moved in. Um, but then the next question was, okay, so who's replacing those officers? It was gonna be more, right? You know, state law was signed um, saying that armed officers need to be in the schools. So it's kind of this um, revolving discussion around safety but not really unpacking what that means for everyone. So there was a lot of pushback, I think, from teachers and, you know, saying, and staff um, wanting schools to be safe and thinking that the only way for schools to be safe means we need to have officers present in the schools. Um, not really understanding that all of that stemmed from uh, the Columbine massacre. <laughs> and that, you know, to me is, mind-boggling to think that um you know the the fact that a white predominantly white school that um had an incident that was tragic for all ended up with over policing black and brown youth in schools like i don't i don't quite understand how the dots connect on that but it it beckons the question of of how and and who and what how did all of this take place? And yes, some of that was hidden in the, you know, fears around um, higher gang activity and all of that. But um, we have to question when we talk about these broad policies, what's the real um, impact for our kids? So it's, it's not just about the, the teachers and staff feeling safe, how are kids feeling? If we look at what's happening right now in our streets and, and the uproar that we have because black and brown people are over policed. That same thing is happening in the schools, has happened in schools. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to. Um, so because we know that, and I'm sorry, I, I have a, uh, deeper um, feeling on this uh, than some maybe because I, you know, my brother is a product of that. And he, he, um, I know that he would have had a different life and trajectory if he had um, been in a system that did not welcome these policies that make it the norm to push our kids out of school and to assume that you're making an environment safer by um, criminalizing kids. So um, I think that's one of the biggest issues is that we are not looking at the collective impact. We present data that says this is what is, this is what has happened. But the context, the understanding of how this has happened has to be a part of the conversation, has to, because otherwise we're looking at it and not really understanding. Okay, so, so how do we end up with these high rates of incarceration? How do we end up with uh, students not achieving in school with low literacy rates and low math uh, rates, like what, what is that? And when we understand that these systemic inequities are baked into this, it's baked into everything, um, then it's, it's a, a greater appreciation for uprooting and changing it all, right? Like it's not just a tweak here and a tweak there. It's something really wrong with all, all of our policies. Like we really have to go back to the beginning of, okay, what, what is this and why is this? Who is it helping? Who is it hurting? Start there. 
And at this point in time, I think when we talk about our education system, to be honest, COVID-19 was probably a, a blessing in disguise because it has caused many across the nation to understand that this is something, these, these problems are not new, that these problems have been here, uh, they're being exposed, and they can't be covered up as they have been in the past. It can't be just a, oh, we're going to throw a little money on this and throw a little, you know, Band-Aid on that. It is all exposed, and it has to be dealt with. And so, yes, I mean, I, I am living the same chaotic life that many of you are, and, and not understanding what that means for our children in the fall or, you know, even uh, tomorrow for that matter. But I believe it is high time for us to talk about how do we change this narrative? How do we work ourselves out of jobs? Because to be honest, I feel like some people are at the table because they know their job is built on problems. And I don't know if you're so convinced that you're trying to help solve those problems or if you continue to um, massage the problems because it keeps you employed, <laughs> to be honest. And I'm gonna stop there because I feel like I'm getting extra, so. <laughs> no, you're fine, it's great. Katori, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I was gonna say like, just the, the, the realness and, um, uh, first, Kish, thank you for sharing, but I think it, there's often times that I've been on Zooms like this and I break down and I get emotional because that's the realness of like what we're living on a day-to-day -day basis. Pre-COVID, pre, -COVID, pre um, the, the racial injustices that we're seeing in the streets across the nation, like pre-2020. So like the things that we're talking about in the emotions all of this, as, as, as black folks, as brown folks, these are the things that were happening or we were feeling before 2020 happened, right? And so like now 2020 is here and like all of these things are exposed. And so um, I just want you to know um, that, that I see you and I hear you and thank you for sharing. Um, but I, I think that as a whole, that I, I think that for me, that's been one of my biggest frustrations is, um, you know, I work in Frankfurt. Um, I'm um, technically a lobbyist. And one of the issues that I have seen is that when we're talking about what policies need to be, need to change, our lawmakers say, well, we can't talk about race. And so for me, it's like, well, we're not talking about the race. Like, what the hell are we talking about? Like, what are we talking about if we're not talking about race? And so I think that for those folks who were on the call, I think that, you know, it's, it's time for um, uh, folks um, other than black and brown folks to step up in a different type of way of, you know, what in a different type of way, you know, you know, what the, you know, um, but I, I think that, that what is, is important is, is that we know these things exist in our day-to-day -day jobs. We see it, we know it. And so like, I just think that it's a time like where, I think that these conversations are great because we have to have them and we haven't had them in this type of way. But for me, it's also like, what are folks going to do about it? Like, what are we as individuals, how are we going to push that? You know? And so I think that um, it is time to really start digging into the, the policy. And, and a lot of it is low hanging fruit, you know, like, you know, there, there's the larger issue of poverty that, you know, it, it's this larger thing of like, how can we solve it? But when you look at, we can just take Louisville, for instance, and the West End, we know that it's a food desert. Like, why has it been so difficult to get grocery stores? Like, that is a super low hanging fruit. But we also know that if kids are getting fed, they're going to show up at school better. We know that when we eat too much carbs or processed food, like what that does to our bodies and when we go to a meeting, we can't think or we can't function. And so it's those small things of like, why aren't we as a community or as people saying like, these are things that we have to do. And why is it even this larger conversation? Like, why does it have to be this huge conversation? And why can't we do it? And it's, for me, it's about really tearing down those uh, systems of racism 
and white supremacy. And we have to do it in a very intentional way and, and face forwarding. And like, we cannot afford not to talk about race. Before we started, um, I, before we started, I got I hopped on early. And one of the things that, I think that one of the things that we can't not talk about is the, um, what, what we're seeing across the nation, what we're seeing that's happened with police brutality. And we're seeing so many people in the streets. We're seeing um, people outraged. We're seeing people pissed off. I'm 40 years old and it's the first time. Well, I remember, I remember being, I think 11 or 12 and like seeing Rod, the, the, the situation with Rodney King. And now we're here in 2020 and we're seeing all these different cases. We're seeing Breonna Taylor. We're seeing Ahmaud Aubrey. Like, we're seeing George Floyd. And I think that what is interesting to me is, is that when we talk about our kids who are witnessing this right now, um, we can just say our 10 year olds who are witnessing and seeing this and they know and understand what's happening. We're about 40 years away from the 100 year mark of the civil rights. And so in, in, in almost 40 years, they'll be 50. Are we still going to be having these same conversations or are things going to be different? And so, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's a lot. I'll just, I'll just leave that there. Thank you. Vivian, were you going to say something before? before? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to Katura mentioned on something that I just kind of wanted to, to say something about, and this is the first time I've seen it and I've been doing public health and, and health equity work a long time. But finally, someone has reached out. Uh, our fellow leg fellow legislators have reached out, um, both Democrat and Republican, to actually do what we call um, health disparity impact review or a health impact assessment, which is before any legislation is written. That's looked at to see if one if this legislation is going to disproportionately impact black and brown communities or one population over the other. So they've actually reached out and had us come up with that language and what that should look like moving forward. So I do think there is some conversation happening. Now, whether that's gonna happen in my, <laughs> in my uh, future years in public health, will that get traction? Will that, you know, uh, hands join across the aisles and say this is a good thing? Um, I'm not sure, but this is the first time that I've heard anyone talk about race and ethnicity and legislation in the same sentence. So I think we are um, at least having a conversation that I've never heard them have before. So I, I have to say I'm hopeful um, that this is going to move, that this is going to cause conversations to continue if it doesn't happen in, in the next legislative session, um, and that this still doesn't have something that's like, like you all said, the conversation of the day, and we move away from this, and it's like, in 50 years from now, I hope we're not having the same conversation. I'll be gone, but I hope my children aren't still impacted and living through this themselves. So, you know, I, I wanted to say that there's some conversation out there. There's some legislation moving forward. Um, I'd like to, I'll keep you all updated on where that, updated on where that is and how it moves. But I do think for the first time, it's promising. So. Great, thank you. Um, kind of to go back, I guess, to, to what Katora was saying before, um, you know, talking about something like the lower hanging fruit. Um, I know that for some people, these conversations are very new and thinking about equity work is, is really new. And, you know, as we're talking about how entrenched um, everything is or, you know, the systemic nature of things, um, it can be really daunting and and feel like a huge undertaking for someone who maybe has not used that lens intentionally or consistently in the past. So can can you all maybe talk a little bit more about other examples of low hanging fruit or like what are some tangible you know action items that people can do first steps that that people can take to start doing this work more intentionally and to kind of start unpacking um, some of what you all have already talked about. Well, I, I guess I would say um, when I hear the 
conversations around equity um, and policy for that matter, I always question what that means to to the you know the in the context of what you're talking about. So um, for some, I think equity is not just um, a notion of if we're talking about race or not, like race equity. It's also fund equity. It's looking at how are your dollars being spent? Um, how are you engaging um, communities? So I'll give an example specifically from the education space. So um, we have the conversations going on now at, within the district around the tax rate increase and how that is uh, supposed to help um, to build facilities, uh, more schools in the West End, um, also repairing some of the schools that have been needing repairs for quite some time. Um, and when that conversation is led by, you know, equity at the front of that conversation, uh, you do question, even within the district, if you say race equity is important, show the connection with the dollars. So where's the financial transparency to say that your decisions are being made with this at the forefront? This is a, a huge consideration. Um, so I do think we always have to be mindful of people's mindsets. Like where are, do you understand the difference between equality and equity? Um, if we're even looking at, for instance, the mental health professionals that um, were uh, kind of allocated in a very equal fashion, right, across the district. So you get a mental health professional, you get a mental health professional, and of course, everyone needs them, right? But if we're being led by equity, we're going to say, you know what, there's some schools that probably need two or three. And this school will probably be okay without getting a new, you know, an extra mental health professional. So th that's what I think, um, like when we're talking baby steps of understanding what that means and equity is um, really looking at what does that collective um, impact and imprint uh, mean, right? So, and you have to be courageous enough to make those recommendations and implement them. So, you know, I've been in, in these conversations talking about, you know, how do we help, how do we, and it's even difficult for people to land on, yes, black and brown students need more assistance or students living in poverty need more assistance or students with language barrier need more assistance. Like, it's just hard to even land on that because it's so, you know, superficial and we have to all be equal in this, you know, talking about everyone when, it's, when we're talking equity, we're really not talking about everyone. Does that make sense? Like, I guess that's one of my biggest things. And when we say the dollars, when we're talking fund equity, oh my, that's when everybody gets uncomfortable and starts shifting in chairs because now you're talking about putting, the mo putting your money where your mouth is. You're saying, you're, okay, race equity, yay, let's go. But then when you talk, okay, so the dollars are going here, but they're not going there, then it's like, well... So we have to be comfortable with the understanding that, yes, if, if you're going to promote this, you have to support it with, with money. So I'll stop. And if I, if I may uh, uh, also, you know, I think that the, the individualistic, capitalistic, uh, patriarchal way that we've been working around, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, you know, individualism and capitalism have made us believe that we have certain value because we have certain characteristics and, 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 and it's like you are in a continuous test, you know, a evaluation and assessment to see if you are worthy enough you know, to get the resources, to get the information or to be included and to be at the table sharing, you know, the real experiences. So in a framework where all of us can uh, change the way that we are doing things in a, in, in a way that is more feminist, 
more circular, more inclusive, more where everybody matters, where, where I am inviting everybody, not only the, the piece of paper that we use to write all the information, but, but as Ms. Kish was saying, you know, where I am putting my money, where I'm putting my investment, you know, because it's so, somebody was, was saying in, in a conversation uh, recently, we don't want charity, we want opportunity and investment. That's what we want. You know, like if we wanna make all the systemic changes that, that, that we are talking about, it's about investing where it needs to be invested. Because if you have a beautiful, amazing school that is not lacking anything, why should you put more money on it while, you know, a school at the West End is, is falling apart? So, you know, all, all those ideas, but, but what happens is this, this very capitalist, individualist and patriarchal way of thinking, oh, the ones that I, I'm not given uh, resources, they are gonna get mad at me and they are the ones with power and they are the ones with resources and they are the ones paying more taxes. So I don't want them to get mad at me. So, you know, in, in, in capitalism and, and white supremacy, what, what happens is that we start competing right? Instead of saying, okay, everybody, so all of us grow. It's like, it's a competition. It happens, you know, to, to uh, uh, different uh, groups of communities that have been minoritized. The system starts making us compete for their resources and to see who is the cutest talking and to see who, who speaks better the language and explains things better. So how do we, you know, start with that, with a clean, with a clean slate where we say, you know, this is a new way of doing things. And maybe, uh, Ms. Ms. Vivian, to, to your point of people reaching out to you, how about us as a collective giving uh, a checklist of things that need to be included in, in, in a law? You know, all of us looking at, at that checklist, what, what are you lacking? It's not only the numbers, it is not only the reflection of what research or evidence says, but also, you know, how it's impacting, you know, the different communities, LGBTQ, immigrant communities, refugee communities, communities that have uh, families with, with children with special care needs. So giving a checklist and say, here, there you go. Have you considered this in, in, in your proposal? Have you considered, you know, checking how it's gonna affect the other people that you don't care about? You know, so being very specific because that's how, you know, a patriarchy works. You need to be specific, you need to give it to, to them in, in their hand. So in that way, it makes sense. I would say, um, speaking on uh, juvenile justice. I would say, justice, um, speaking on, I feel like I'm, okay. That, that a couple of things that are low hanging fruit when we're talking about juvenile justice is, um, in Kentucky, any age young person can be charged with a crime um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will go um, to juvenile detention, but they can be charged. And so they can be charged and either be arrested. When I was a court designated worker, um, I had a nine year old that came through the back door of the juvenile detention center. Um, and so I think that we need to um, establish an age of uh, responsibility of saying that we as a state will not um, charge um, kids under the age of 12 with Actually, I would like for it to be 13, but that's, you know, what we can talk about that later, but there just needs to be um, something established. Um, we do know that the um, youth brain, the human brain is not fully developed. And I think that we need to start um, uh, thinking about those things and, and leading with that framework when we're talking about um, uh, consequences and rehabilitation uh, for youth. And then also, um, Last year, it was Senate Bill 87, I believe that's the correct number, um, that um, automatic transfer to adult court. And so currently in Kentucky, um, certain charges, kids can automatically be transferred to adult courts, meaning that the judge or the prosecutor doesn't have any say so of saying like, uh, maybe this kid doesn't need to be um, in adult court. And so I think that those are two uh, pieces of policies that we can um, change right now with um, juvenile justice. And then also last one is um, uh, a, a, a bill around data. Um, we know that our 
uh, kids are the same type of kids who are in social services and juvenile justice. And so um, how do we share data across systems? You know, one of the things is that people say is, is their youth, we have to make sure that we are keeping their identity separate and, you know, um, all these different types of laws around um, uh, privacy and all of that. But I think that that's an excuse. And I think that we really need to push hard on that of like, how do we really deal with our kids in a holistic way? Um, and, and, and knowing that, especially our service providers or people in the field, we know that they're the same type of kids. And so how do we make sure that we're providing them with the things that they need so they don't get deeper um, into the system? Great, thank you, Katora. Um, and thank you, Vivian and Karina and Kish, um, all of you for joining us and for sharing all of this important information. Um, we could, I could go on for probably like another hour just listening to you all talk. This is, it's a great starting conversation. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and throw it to Mahek now to close us out. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you to all of our panelists for being vulnerable and helping expose. Um, I think that was the word that was used a lot today's conversation, expose the racial injustice. Um, as Courtney mentioned on the top of this conversation, this is just the tipping point of the work that we're gonna be doing as an organization and also as child advocates across the state. So um, thank you to our panelists. I've gotten to know you um, guys each personally for the last month and some of you for the past few years. So I'm excited to continue this conversation. Thank you to our child advocates um, from across the state. Some reflections that I heard, and I'm gonna make this quick, is we need accessible and transparency around um, data among all sectors. We have to be intentional of understanding, learning, and engaging people of um, color not only to help mitigate the solutions, but to help create the solutions as well. Um, and when we're talking about equity, it's not, we're not saying equity is equal. It means digging deeper and looking at areas that have suffered um, from these disadvantages and seeing if we could focus on solutions and opportunities in those areas. Um, and lastly, I feel a sense of hope, uh, hopefulness just in our tone um, just because we are having conversations of low hanging fruit that we could already work towards, um, whether that is, you know, health and racial equity assessments among all policy fund analysis or pushing beyond this. Um, it's, this is great. I know, I know I feel a sense of hopeless, uh, hopefulness as we move forward. Um, and lastly, before I sign us off, a quick preview of next week's forum. And uh, Kotora, you mentioned food. And so we are gonna be talking about food security and access um, with the Agriculture Commissioner, uh, Ryan Quarles, as well as Kate McDonald with Feeding Kentucky and um, Lee Fage with the Kentucky School Nutrition Association. And as always, we'll be sending a follow-up email with information regarding today's recording, um, an RSVP link for next week's call, a federal um, fund action alert, um, and our kids count data and supplemental data that we have, and lastly, our COVID page. So we hope to see everyone next week and have a great rest of your Wednesday.